I'm not going to disagree that it has to be accountable. I mean, but the dollar happens to be a lot easier to exchange when mm -hmm. we get to a central bank digital currency. And we're going to get there, which I think is actually much more exciting in a lot of ways. As I said, I think gold has a run to have. OK, I think the central bank digital currency is going to be much more exciting because it's going to dramatically get rid of the too big to fail banks in the U.S. Right now, the only people who are entitled to have an account with the Federal Reserve are J.P. Morgan, Citi, and banks. You got to be a bank. When you get to central bank digital currency, and what digital currencies are all about is transacting, there's no reason for, that you and I shouldn't have a central bank digital currency account. So therefore, I could send you money, and it goes through the central bank. Okay, they see what I have in my account. They know I can pay it off. They just transfer it over. Mm -hmm. The beauty of that, though, is I just took all the banks, the private banks, out of the process. The payment system goes from being held hostage by these big private banks to no longer being held hostage. It's yeah. now a service provided by the federal government. All of a sudden, things like FDIC insurance are no longer needed. No, if you put deposits with J.P. Morgan, you've got the risk that J.P. Morgan will fail. Mm -hmm. So you, as an investor, have an incentive to do some homework as to whether they're going to survive or not. That's what the advent of central bank digital currency is going to get to us. I'm guest, Mr. Richard Field, the director of the Institute for Financial Transparency, as well as the author of the book, Transparency Games, How Bankers Rig the World of Finance. Today, Richard joins us to share his thoughts on the economy, the global financial system, as well as how to navigate these uh, very unprecedented times. So, Richard, welcome to RTD Interviews. Thank you very much, Mike. It's a pleasure to well, be here. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate you taking time to join us. As I mentioned before, we went on there. Looking forward to getting your thoughts on where we're at and where we're heading and your assessment on uh, the importance of transparency amongst all this stuff happening in the uh, financial and the macro world. But before we get into that, uh, for those who may not be familiar with you, can you give us a little bit of your background and how you got into what you're currently doing now? Sure. I started off working for the Federal Reserve in the early 1980s when they raised interest rates up into the low 20% to beat inflation at the time. I then went to work for what became a too big to fail bank before leaving that to get into the world of transparency. And transparency is something that's pretty simple. Anything that you buy, you should know what you own. That seems like a very simple way of saying it. Unfortunately, Wall Street has captured the SEC, which was supposed to have us have the disclosure of the facts that we need to know what we own. So for example, when we got to 2008 and the financial markets imploded on themselves, well, the reason was they didn't know what they owned. We had these structured finance securities and nobody knew what was inside them. We had these banks and again, nobody knew what was inside them. Now, answer the question of how did we get to where we are today? In 2008, the decision was made to save the banks which was a, actually a fascinating decision, given that banks are designed to fail. That's what they did in the Great Depression. So rather than having the real economy save the banks, the design of our financial system is, is that the banks are supposed to protect the real economy. And they do that by absorbing losses. So fast forward, we did things like we took interest rates down to essentially zero for the last decade plus. That was in an effort to save the banks because banks do better when their cost of funds is zero. Okay. The next thing they did was they had foreclosures. We had 10 million plus foreclosures. Rather than have losses taken by the banks, the losses were effectively taken by the individuals who had tried to buy the houses. So we had massive social impact in terms of those people being thrown out of their houses. Today, one of the things you see is that 25 to 30% of all houses being purchased aren't purchased by individuals and their families. They're purchased by Wall Street. That is a legacy of those 10 million houses that came onto the market. As Wall Street was buying them up and Wall Street said, oh, this is a good business. 
And then they noticed that you could get more from rent and being able to depreciate your house than you could if you were buying, say, a U.S. Treasury. Mm, so, okay. <laughs> that's for starters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, you, you laid a lot on us right there, but that's the essence of how we arrived here. So, thank you for sharing that. And definitely, you know, your background definitely shows that you have a very unique perspective having worked within and now you're out now trying to shine light on what's going on. And so, you know, now what we're experiencing uh, is not an isolated event. And so, what we're experiencing here, it's, you know, we're hearing two different narratives. And on top of the events happening out east and the things happening with, you know, central banks around the world, uh, it looks like it's a global contagion that's occurring all at once. And so uh, I take it that with the current ex things we're experiencing with the Federal Reserve looking to fight inflation, as far as what we're being told, I'm not sure how that'll pan out. But give us your take on that. Uh, is that something they're actually trying to do? Or is that just more so talk? There's two elements to that question. Let's go back to the first element which is what is monetary policy actually capable of doing? That seems like a relevant question to ask. I mean, there's this fantastic narrative surrounding the Fed and monetary policy. The narrative starts with the Fed can raise or lower interest rates. And as a result of its raising or lowering interest rates, you and I will take or not take some economic action. I will buy a house because interest rates went down, or we won't buy a house because interest rates went up. The next piece of that process is because of our action, it will have an impact on inflation. Okay, so the Fed doesn't directly impact inflation, it impacts the real economy. And through the real economy, it impacts inflation. That's their narrative. And isn't that a great narrative? I mean, the priesthood of the economic PhDs have been spouting that narrative now since the early 1980s, patting themselves on the back for the Volcker era. Now, when I was at the Fed during the Volcker era, there was only one problem with that narrative. We couldn't find a connection between the Fed raising rates and inflation going down, which is a stunning statement. Okay, you would expect if the narrative was true and the Fed raised rates 1%, you would see the economy say go down, its growth rate slide down by half a percent, and you would see inflation drop by say two, three percent. You couldn't find that in the numbers. You've never been able to find that in the numbers. Right. So the priesthood invented a new term. It was called a lag. The reason you couldn't see it in the numbers is it didn't happen immediately. Well, okay, so start with three months. You didn't see it, the impact in three months. Go out to six months. You didn't see it in six months. Go out to nine months. You didn't see it in nine months. So the priesthood came back and said, okay, that's not what we meant. It's long and variable lags. Okay. If you're not an economics PhD, what you recognize immediately from that is it doesn't work. And they're just not willing to confess that fact. Yeah, we're, we're, a, little actually, too, we're, we're a little too late in the game for them to come out now and uh, admit to that uh, that's correct. not they're, uh, something they're, actually work. They're never going to admit it. And if you think about what's going on with inflation today, the first place you and I recognize inflation is at the gas pump. The second place you and I recognize inflation is when we buy food, okay? And just between the two of us, I don't think I'm going to eat less because they change the interest rate. They raise the interest rates a couple of percent. It just doesn't affect my diet that much, right. okay? Right, very true. Now, 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 let me interject for you if you don't mind. So the, the, the defining of inflation uh, it, there's different. I think there might be different camps as to how you define it. Some people from the Austrian school side might say might talk about the increase of the monetary supply, and of course we've witnessed. I don't know what I think it was multiple trillions added to their balance sheet throughout the last ten years, especially. But in particular, what I think 60, 80, say 80, 60, 80 percent of the money supply brought into existence. How does that factor into this narrative of them trying to, you know, increase rates when the supply of currency available? And what's on, on balance sheets and what's actually in cash form is much greater than uh, those rates that they're talking about trying to use. If the Fed's going to raise rates, the classic way it would do so is it sells 
treasuries. And what it does is it takes money out of the system when it does that, which forces up the rates because it makes everything go, the, the bonds more expensive and that classically, that's part of their story. That's the priesthood story. Now think about this a second. We have had Japan since 1989, roughly. It has flooded its market with yen. It buys the Japanese bond market. It owns 95% of the Japanese bond market. For 30 plus years now, it's been considered the widow trade is to think that the Japanese interest rates are gonna go nuts. They're gonna get hyperinflation. You just don't make money on that trade. Well, that goes against this concept that we have to worry about the number of dollars in circulation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just to be blunt about it, it doesn't appear that it triggers inflation, mm -hmm. the numbers of dollars. By the way, in the details of all of this, there's something called money times velocity. That works its way out onto the inflation side of price times whatever. But if you keep printing money, Velocity keeps plummeting. And if you look at every chart that we have, velocity continues plummeting. Right. So you know, it's been going down for 40 years, as far as I can tell. Right. <laughs> now, now, let me ask you a question. Like, you know, so, so definitely that is, uh, uh, that, is, that is obvious, you know, as far as the velocity of money, you know, dwindling down. But also, you know, one of the things that I can imagine the viewers might say is that, you know, we're in unprecedented times of everything not really making sense, everything being turned upside down, markets, evaluations at all time, how housing prices all time high, and all that, all those the asset bubbles have been inflated because of the easing of monetary policy. And whenever someone signs their name for a loan, that further expands the overall credit available, aka monetary instruments of, you know, in, this, in the system, and so would you say that that is a part of the problem as well? Because you say currency is not a, a real concern as far as, I guess, inflation. But how do you how do you account for all the bubbles that's being put out there? Or maybe I'm wrong. Well, let's go to different bubbles that are being blown. OK, because you have to look at each one of these as a different, you know, what's the driver of it? The housing bubble isn't being driven by demand by you and not me for home ownership is being driven by the fact that Wall Street has decided it's a good asset to own to extract money from. Mm. Wall Street historically was not a big player here. And over the last decade, they've become huge. You, you know, when you suddenly have what I call the cash buyer show up in the market, they're not getting a loan. Right. <laughs> they, they, these guys are showing up. They got huge bank accounts. I mean, I think I read someplace where they have like upwards of $100 billion to spend on housing, these buyers. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they are not showing up with rates moving up or down. It's not going to have any impact on them. The only impact it will have is it will take people like you and I out of buying the house if rates move up. So they'll be able to buy the house from the seller for less. Right. They don't have to have it at the all-time highs. I mean, it's just incredible to watch. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was markets like Phoenix, which in 2008, 2009, fell 45%, which is huge. I mean, this was the claim of house prices never decline. And literally, they went down 45%. It's now up from there more than doubled from those house prices. Most of that increase has happened in the last two to three years as the Wall Street has shown up buying. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Now, so yeah. I'm curious. Well, that's, a, that's one market. I mean, yeah. for oh. the guys who own, I mean, I have a couple of good friends on, I do this debate with on gold. They love gold. Okay. Let's get to gold because I think it's got some value. I don't think it's currently recognized the value, but I don't think gold is going to be like substituted back for our currency, mm -hmm. okay? If you read the Cross of Gold speech by Williams Jennings Bryan, you could see that gold has some problems when it's your national currency, okay? Just trust me, this is an amazing speech. Yeah. The next thing you have to recognize about gold is 
We had the Great Depression while we were on the gold standard. And I'm highly reluctant to go back to a standard where I could have a Great Depression. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I think with the current cash, the way we have it, we're not going to get a depression. Okay, so uh, that said, I think gold is undervalued today. I think people have been playing with Bitcoin. And they have, your, your viewers might have acquired a lot of Bitcoin and have done quite well with it. But there's no reason to own Bitcoin <laughs> that I can figure out. Yeah. Okay. Unlike gold, you can't throw it against the wall. <laughs> okay. There's no <laughs> very, other. Very, very true. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's no use for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. They go, oh, there's only going to be 26 million of them ever issued. Okay. Given my background, the first thing I thought of is, let me start a closed-end mutual fund. I'm going to have 26 million shares in the closed-end mutual fund. And I'm going to issue them for a dollar a piece. You will never see another share issued by that mutual closed-end mutual fund. How is that different than Bitcoin? Mm, good point. And, and I, of course, you know, I'm not here to defend the digital asset space because I think it's a part of this you know, restructuring of the monetary order taking us towards the central bank digital currencies. And a lot of it has to do more with the Trojan horse appearance than it is actual as some people might want to say, it's you know, it's unbank, it's 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 doing away with the banks, it's uh, decentralized, all those narratives they try to sell you with. I'm not in that camp. I'm very skeptical, but um, I want to go back to the to the gold uh, aspect of things because I, I know that over the last five or six or seven years of me trying to you know rethink or think beyond the current monetary structure, you know, I, you can't help but see how the repatriation of gold is a part of an equation down the line of some kind. Not sure if it's to reestablish trust amongst nations or there is going to be a gold coin peg, some or some type of situation that might be done amongst you know governments or what not sure. But gold is a, a being positioned as a tier one asset again for the banking structure with Basel three and all that stuff like that. So gold is a part of the equation. I'm not quite sure how to play out, but it has importance to some people out there. Right. No, no, nor do our central bankers know how to play with it. What uh -huh. they know is is that gold has a unique position in the commodity space mm -hmm. that we don't have a lot of it. It's a much more finite asset, mm -hmm. okay? So therefore it's not subject to sort of the whims of, do I want to pump more of it today? Mm -hmm. Okay, we, we don't have that. That's gold's special characteristic. It also has a special characteristic because we have intrinsically thought of gold with jewelry. So it's been uniquely valued in terms of people think of it as having some importance. As I said, I think gold right now is underpriced. That's my personal position towards it. Right, I'd agree. It could be underpriced anywhere from 20 to 40%. Mm -hmm. Well, it's where I think it should be, but it's not like the great inflation hedge, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. This is just an asset that happens to be underpriced. Right. Okay. One, one of the ways I look at it and try to help people see it from just, you know, multiple angles. Of course, you know, this is all just my opinion, but I always say that based upon history and learn, learning about how governments, you know, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, all those smaller currencies that really are impact the lives of individuals in the, within those regions, how, you know, it, there's been ways of hedging and protecting and preserving the transfer of your energy, savings, financial future, all of that, you know, when you get out of, or you when you redeem, I like to you know remind people that fiat currency, in particular Federal Reserve notes, were always they were introduced as a redeemable instrument for <laughs> real gold and silver, which is money in my opinion. And so everyone has the right to redeem some of those notes at any point you want to. But I always say that at some point, every single Federal Reserve note must be held accountable when it comes to how many you have to redeem for an ounce of gold or silver or nickel or anything else out there that is real from the earth because it's all about just being able to acquire what you need when you need it and you need something to, that's a accountable measure of value in between <laughs> so that, that's how i look at it on my, on my side a little bit yeah, no, 
I, I'm not going to disagree that it has to be accountable, I mean, but the dollar happens to be a lot easier to exchange. When we get to a central bank digital currency, and we're going to get there, okay, which I think is actually much more exciting in a lot of ways. As I said, I think gold has a run to have, okay? Mm-hmm. I think the central bank digital currency is going to be much more exciting because it's going to dramatically get rid of the too big to fail banks in the U.S. Mm, you think so? Okay. Can you elaborate? It? Elaborate, please. I'm curious to see that one. Well, right now, the only people who are entitled to have an account with the Federal Reserve are you and are JP Morgan, City, and banks. You got to be a bank. When you get to central bank digital currency, and what digital currencies are all about is transacting. There's no reason that you and I shouldn't have a central bank digital currency account. So therefore, I could send you money and it goes through the central bank. Okay, they see what I have in my account. They know I can pay it off. They just transfer it over. Mm -hmm. The beauty of that, though, is I just took all the banks, the private banks, out of the process. The payment system goes from being held hostage by these big private banks to no longer being held hostage. Okay, it's now a service provided by the federal government. Hmm. All of a sudden things like FDIC insurance are no longer needed Hmm. because now you know if you put deposits with JP Morgan, you've got the risk that JP Morgan will fail. Mm -hmm. So you as an investor have an incentive to do some homework as to whether they're gonna survive or not. Right. That's what the advent of central bank digital currency is gonna to get to us. Yeah, and so I, I, I hear you, I see your point, and then I can hear people watching as they're concerned because you know we've watched the, 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 the progression of the monetary system from gold and silver in physical hands to being deposited, to being given receipts, then receipts turn into digital ledger transactions, now, digital ledger transactions turn into solely digital on the ledger of a single entity, the most powerful entity in our country. And the programmability behind that causes a lot of concerns, I must admit for myself, just because if it's created by them, it's controlled by them, they control everything about it. And if you're not playing according to their rules, or if they choose to say that we don't like how you're spending it, you're going to have to show us proof of how this, that, whatever, or we can just hit a switch. And that's to me very, I consider that dangerous on my part, but. Let me, let me say what I said was it gets rid of the FDIC insurance. Okay. It gets rid of the bailouts of the big banks. Mm -hmm. It does not change whether you put some money with any of those institutions. Mm. But now what you're saying to yourself is, if I want to spend money that I don't want the federal government tracking, and by the way, the legislation that's necessary could tell the government it can't track, okay? The legislation can do all sorts of things to protect anonymity here. Mm-hmm. But the fact is you could have still a bank account. You probably have a money market mutual fund. You can just transact through your money market mutual fund and nobody cares mm-hmm. what, how you spent it, okay? What I'm trying to do is to move the payment system out of the, the banks and into the Fed, into under the government. There's no reason the government shouldn't be the, All right. the hub. And by the way, you're comfortable getting a report from your bank that says you have so many dollars in your mm-hmm. deposit account? Mm-hmm. But but see, but, but, I, but see, but see on, on this side, on alternative media side, we're we're aware that those that 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 those that ledger doesn't really represent what we have just because it's not even there. Uh, <laughs> it's just on a screen somewhere that's not on a network that I control. But it, I'm I'm curious to get your thoughts on you know you mentioned the back into the government's hands and so the treasury was you was supposed to be the primary financial overseers of our country's financial operations until the central bank the third one came into existence the Federal Reserve. And so they've become the primary uh, issuer, controller of elasticity of credit and things of that nature, all the things the Federal Reserve you know, was taught, you know, p- given to us to do. Now, the Treasury and the Federal Reserve, they work together, but then again, they are not separate. We have some chairman come out and say that we're independent. We don't take orders from nobody because we're 
want to remain give me give me your thoughts on that because we're told one thing but yet we're witnessing something different i think but what do, what do you think 40 plus years ago when i was at the fed that i told you that was bs <laughs> so let's not go anywhere <laughs> the fed is a political animal okay it's answerable to the politicians in dc and therefore it responds to them it does not adopt policies that the politicians don't want, ever. Mm -hmm. That's not in its makeup, nor do they have anybody who's ever been in the Fed chair position who would do so, okay? That said, so they listen to what they're asked for. Then they try to create a narrative as, about how they're delivering what's been asked of them. But the narrative conveniently leaves the, po the politicians out of it so that the Fed is there to take blame. Like if it drives up in interest rates and that results in unemployment, it's the Fed that's blamed for unemployment as opposed to politicians. Okay, so they're there for that purpose. Uh, yes, the Fed and the Treasury have separated their functions uh, the Fed was given the, you know, the Treasury runs the Mint. So if you ever go down to D.C., you can see, go, go to visit the Mint and you'll get to see the Treasury in operations. Mm -hmm. However, the, every dollar that's picked up is picked up by the Fed. And it's the Fed that actually puts the money from the Mint into circulation. It's one of those wonderful things. Yeah. That, to say that they're different, okay. The, you know, they're somehow they're separated at the hip, right? <laughs> like I'm, not, I'm not believing it. I'm just not, okay? Yeah. Uh, when Janet Yellen is out there today talking, okay, she is doing this at the G20, fully having talked with Paul. They're on the same page as to what they're trying to get accomplished. You'll notice that central banks around the world are at the same time raising interest rates. Inflation is a global phenomenon. There's nothing any central bank can do to stop it. Mm. Again, energy prices are energy prices. We're takers of energy prices. And in fact, you might argue that raising rates is the worst thing you can do to try to lower energy prices because energy requires dollars invested to drill more wells, to pump up more oil, et cetera, et cetera. And you need more facilities to process all of that, if you raise the price of capital, becomes more expensive and suggests that the price of oil going forward is going to continue to go up. So it's it's just not not clear to me, you know. All right. <laughs> As I said, I don't think they can do anything about current inflation, but they all want to get out of zero interest rates. They've all been trapped. Yeah. That was a bad policy. Yeah. Now they're trying to get away from zero and based upon prior corrections, crashes, whatever we call them, there was always some wiggle room to be able to drop to provide support to reestablish confidence in credit lending, whatever. But we're at zero now. And it, will, will they backtrack? Will we go to real negative, uh, real negative federal funds rate, even though we're, we're real now we, just for inflation, but Will we see like a negative, like similar to situations in Europe where there's negative, you know, 10 or never negative, negative number in real, in real terms in the U.S. with the reserve currency? The, the, the short answer was I tweeted many times that I had dreams of having a negative 5% mortgage because it was no fair. I thought it was no fair that if you lived in like the Netherlands, they actually got paid to have a mortgage for right. several years. I, mean, I thought this was outrageous that you know, I too wasn't getting paid for a mortgage. That said, I think the Fed and the central banks have realized that zero is a bad number. It's not a question of they can't then provide additional support to the economy. It's, it causes all sorts of problems, okay? You do get all those bubbles that we're talking about, mm -hmm. they're all related to the fact that you're financing at zero. Right. A lot of bubbles go away when you stop financing at zero. 
By the way, in the 1870s, Walter Bagette, who was the founder of the modern central bank, he's the guy who wrote Lombard Street, Mm -hmm. said 2% is the minimum interest rate for an economy to actually function properly. So so that's where the 2% mandate that all central banks use, that's where that originated from. (laughs) That is really its historical origination. And it was confirmed in the 1930s by Keynes. Mm. Okay. He comes out with all of his theories that unify all this, you know, the fiscal policy and the monetary policy, et cetera. And he says, don't go below 2% either. But that was to him, that was like, you're now exactly where you should not be. And if you look at what has happened in the U.S., in response to the 2000 internet bubble, we cut our interest rates below 2%. And exactly as those guys predicted, we got ourselves into an interesting next bubble, okay? Where we were pushing capital where it shouldn't be, i.e. housing. And now 2008, it blows up as they finally got themselves back above 2%, <laughs> the first thing these guys do is cut it back to zero. And now you're looking at the bubble of all bubbles, you know, because virtually everything that wasn't like a hard asset, like gold, went to the moon with 0%. But that's what you do with a stock, which has supposedly a discount rate in it. When the discount rate drops to effectively zero, the value of future cash flow goes up exponentially. That's just the calculation. Gold doesn't have that. On the other hand, gold had a nice characteristic. When you're at zero, it costs you nothing to store. Okay? Yeah. I'm thinking what you're going to see over the next few months is if the interest rate goes up, gold's going to also go up, even though cost of storage goes up. People are going to be looking at that and go, oh, this is an asset that didn't have the bubble hit it. That's why I said, I think there's a lot of room here for you. Mm, interesting. So as we get ready to wind down, um, okay. you've laid out a lot of interesting angles to look at the issues we face. Now, it's only 20, it's February 4th, April 2022. Um, looking ahead now, I, I don't, where do you see the current Federal Reserve or the current central banking model based upon we're at zero or negative real interest rates, depending on how it's calculated? The, 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 the removal or the introduction of a central bank digital currency, of course, cash in society is going to be talked about heavily if it's not already, because most people prefer to have tap and pay type of systems. Where do we go in the future with this? What, what's, the, what's, the, what's the final outcome of all this, in your opinion? We're going to get there. I mean, we're not going to get there in another year or two. It's going to be probably three to five years out before central bank digital currencies introduced by the U.S., I think at the same time we do that, just because we're in tax season or just ended it, we're also going to have changed how taxes are done in this country so that rather than you and I spending hours agonizing over our taxes, the IRS is going to send us the information that says, here's what we have for your income. Here's what we collected for taxes against it. And here's the refund you owed. If any of this is wrong, Please let us know and fill out a a tax form. But for everybody else, that's going to go away. By the way, that's how they do it in a lot of countries in Europe. And nobody complains there about it. As I said, as long as you, you know, your sources of income are already reported, why are you spending a minute, you know, doing your taxes? (laughs) But... That's going to coordinate with the introductions of central bank digital currencies because it makes sense because you're going to have a central bank account. I'm going to have a central bank account. It all kind of flows together nicely. So Mm -hmm. we're actually going to get some conveniences of the information age. Yeah. And it really is going to be up to our Congress to make sure that the limitations on government are properly put in on what I see as that future. Right. Good point there. Now, the last question I want to get your thoughts on what's happening, what's 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 unfolding with Russia now being excluded from 
the current financial structure and them appearing. You know, there's two different narratives, of course, depending on which one you want to you know pull upon for your information. But yet the world has turned its back on Russia. Russia is ri- rich in natural resources. They have everything they need to probably contain themselves for quite some time. And the gold is being mentioned. Their central bank is buying gold at a cheaper rate, as well as Russia's demanding payments in the ruble now. Is this any type type of threat you think to the current payment structure of the monetary system, or is this something to be dismissed in your opinion? I'm always dismissing the idea that the dollar will not be the reserve currency when you and my grandchildren are playing together. Mm. Okay. Okay. We are a long, long ways. I mean, reserve currency status is, is implies all sorts of things like legal contracts. It implies an ability to enforce your currency. N- nobody is exactly challenging the U.S. militarily. Nobody has a better developed legal system than the U.S. Okay, so there's the enforcement. Oil isn't priced in rubles. Oil is priced in dollars. Mm -hmm. They might say, we want so many rubles instead, but it's a conversion from one to the other. Mm -hmm. So now, as for is Russia going to come back into the fold of nations? Of course it is. Okay. What's it going to take is a different issue. I mean, I'm, you know, I don't know that Putin has necessarily stopped when he swallows the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. He could easily be looking up, saying the Baltic nations. He could easily be thinking Finland, et cetera. I would not pretend to know what the man's long run agenda is. Mm. Very true. Very true. No, but I was going to say, so as we draw towards the end, any last thoughts you want to leave us with? And and also make sure you you point people back towards your information. want to make sure the people plug in with what you have uh, to offer as well. Okay. The last thoughts are, you asked for how are we going to get ourselves out of the problem that we have today? I have been saying this for over a decade, but we have to restore transparency in our financial system. Okay. Let's find out whether our banks are actually solvent or not. That's easy enough to do. Let's not have the government going in and pretending they're solvent. Let's have them disclose. When you suddenly get disclosure, it's remarkable how much better the financial system works. House prices would in fact start coming down a little bit and people would start questioning the, why is Wall Street involved in single family housing? When that goes against the American dream, suddenly it's easy for Congress to take action, okay? That's one of the advantages and things that transparency brings to the marketplace. And to me, that's really always been the starting point when we wanna get over kind of how much we're upset with DC. We started with transparency, okay? Let's see who's buying our politicians. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the whole nine yards here. It's, transparency is a wonderful tool and it just needs to be brought back. Right. I agree. I agree. And, I'll, and also you, you mentioned transparency, you know, two things that jump out to me right away is, you know, Ron Paul's push for years ago of auditing the Fed would be a different way of approaching it. And then also auditing Fort Knox and see if the gold is really there or not because it, yeah. 50, 60 uh, years uh, since. So those would be two ways to really reestablish trust amongst the populace, I think, <laughs> for those who are even care or even know. <laughs> there's, there's zero reason that we shouldn't audit the Fed. Okay. I'd love, to, I, mean, I apologize for this story, but there was a gentleman by the name of Mark Pittman at Bloomberg who in 2008 sued the Fed. I think it was 2008, maybe it was early 2009. He sued the Fed to get the information on one of its loan programs where it was bailing out the banks. He wanted to know how much money the Fed was giving to all of these large banks and what the terms on the money were. It took Bloomberg, because he he worked was a reporter there, it took Bloomberg like four years to finally win the lawsuit so that the Fed had to disclose. And what it turned out is, is the Fed had given roughly 12 plus billion dollars worth of taxpayer money because the they underpriced the loans to our largest banks. 
Well, I think a lot of people would have been really upset in real time had they heard that was going on. Mm -hmm. I think the Fed wouldn't have been able to do so. So the whole idea of audit the Fed to me is let's find out what all those programs are, okay, that they're doing. Because there's a lot of money transferring from the Fed to these banks. Mm -hmm. Let's see if there's really being properly priced. When modern central banks were put in position, the idea was that you lent at high rates of interest against good assets. Mm -hmm. That would discourage the bank from borrowing from you unless it was in a crisis mode. For the last decade plus, we've reversed that. And the Fed lends at low rates of interest against, I'm not sure, very good assets. Right. (laughs) Yeah, it, it's a lot of conflicts of interest in that whole contanglement of how mon- the monetary structure is ordered, just because also some of the, if not a good portion of the globally systemic important banks in the U.S. happen to be shareholders of the Federal Reserve branches throughout the country. So that is a problem in of itself. But that's for another day because <laughs> uh, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> that's when it's addressed by transparency, because yeah. it makes you completely can see what the transactions are. So I don't care about the conflicts of interest Mm -hmm. when two conflicted parties have to transact where it's transparent what they've done. Yeah. Anyhow, thank you so much. But Richard, once again, thank you for joining us on RT Interviews. Great discussion. Appreciate you. And of course, I'll put your information beneath this, but hopefully have you on in the future and get your thoughts on where we're at because you you, you bring a unique perspective and and I value that highly. So thank you for joining us on RT Interviews. Thank you for the time. Take care, Mike.